Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Um, today I'm going to be going through um, this paper from 2013. Um, it's A2 Biology, so let's get straight into it. Okay, first question. Huntington's disease is an inherited disease of the central nervous system. The, sim the symptoms of HD usually develop in adulthood and include uncontrollable muscular movements, short-term memory loss and changes in mood. HD is caused by a dominant allele of the Huntington disease on chromosome 4. Um, explain what is meant by terms allele and dominant. So, nice easy question to <laughs> ease you into this paper. So, an allele is um, an alternative form of, of a gene, so it's a variation of a gene. Um, that is found in the same place on, on the chromosome. And then dominant, um, a dominant allele is, um, is, is a, do a dominant allele is always expressed itself. So um, in the phenotype where, when, the, if, when it's present. So nice, two easy questions. Next, the nom dominant allele of the Huntingdon gene contains many repeats of a triplet sequence of nucleotide CAG. The age at which symptoms of HD first appear is linked with the number of CAG repeats. It's shown in figure 1.1. So the question is uh, to describe the pattern. So um, one of the um, obvious things um, that we can immediately see is that the greater the number of uh, the CAG repeats, um, the earlier the symptoms will appear. So it's inversely um, proportional. So, for example, if you have a look here, um, when you when you get close to around sixty CAG repeats, um, the age at which the symptoms appear is twenty. Whereas if you have a lower sort of like thirty to thirty five repeats, then the onset of the symptoms is sixty years old. All right. Um, a blood test to detect the dominant allele is available for people at risk of HD. Suggest why some people at risk of HD may decide not to take the blood test. So many reasons, various reasons. So one of the risks of having HD is that normally um, the symptoms appear um, after people have already had children. So um, they won't know whether um, they've already... So, so by the time they figure out that they have HD, they have probably already... Um, given it to their children as it's a dominant allele. Um, so if it's about a person that is not going to have children, since there is no real cure for HD, um, it might not be in their interest to have the blood test anyway. Um, another one could be just the cost of the, cost of the test. Um, then, so m maybe the fear that it will affect um, uh, other, other family members or just the fear of the positive result in general, all right? Mammoths are extinct mammals related to elephants. About three million years ago, the, ancestor, the ancestors of mammoths migrated from Africa into Europe and Asia. There, about 1.7 million years ago, the steppe mammoth evolved and became adapted to the cooler conditions. Then about 700,000 years ago, as the climate changed and the Arctic became much colder, the woolly mammoth evolved. Woolly mammoths uh, showed a number of obvious adaptations to reduce heat loss, including thick fur, small ears, and small tails. Explain how variation and natural selection may have brought about the evolution of the woolly mammoth from the steppe mammoth. So this question is kind of tr just trying to um, make you talk about um, how um, natural selection works um, in a specific example. So in this case, the evolution of the woolly mammoth. So I think the best way to approach this is just kind of go through step by step how um, it would happen. So you can start about saying that um, in a population of mammoths, um, the individuals uh, have variation in their phenotypes, um, which is caused by a genetic variation or mutation, of course, in addition to environmental um, differences, sorry, developmental differences. Um, however, uh, when the climate started shifting from sort of the steppe um, to uh, the Arctic becoming much colder, um, there was a change in selection pressure. So the, um, the individuals in, within the population that had um, the phenotypes that would 
um, uh, give them an advantage uh, to survive. So, for example, the thicker fur, smaller ears and small tails, um, it, that gave them an advantage and increased the chance, the chances of survival. So, uh, the survivors would breed and pass their alleles off to their offspring, and eventually this would result in uh, changing or increasing um, their allele frequencies within the population. So over a period of time, this would um, eventually even cause speciation, and then um, the woolly mammoth could evolve from the step mammoth. Of course, you must remember that an individual doesn't evolve. Evolution applies to a population. Okay. A frozen 43,000-year-old woolly mammoth was found in Siberia. Its DNA was extracted and sequenced. The sequences of the genes coding for the alpha and beta chains of hemoglobin were compared with those of modern Asian elephants. The results suggested, when compared with Asian elephants, that there was only one different amino acid in the woolly mammoth's alpha chains and there were three different amino acids in the woolly mammoth's beta chains. He explained the likely effect of these differences of, on a molecule of mammoth hemoglobin. Um, so, um, the how did this? So, how does this kind of mutation? What does this cause? Um, so, this uh, mutation would cause uh, a difference in the primary structure of the amino acids of the polypeptides, um, which means that uh, the different amino acids have different R groups. Um, and this uh, would mean that um, the different amino acids could influence how the protein folds up into their its tertiary structure, so um, which in turn would affect the, the quaternary structure. Um, however, because there is more difference in the beta chains, there is a greater effect on the beta chains than on the alpha chains, and all of this would contribute into different properties of the entire hemoglobin molecule. Um, great. So, next, scientists synthesized woolly mammoth hemoglobin in order to investigate whether or not the different hemoglobin was part of the mammoth's adaptation to a cold climate. The affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen is affected by the changes in temperature that can occur in mammals, for example in active muscle tissue or close to the skin surface. It's advantageous for Arctic mammals to have hemoglobin whose affinity for oxygen is only slightly affected by changes in temperature. This is, only, this is often achieved uh, by using substances called red cell effectors, which bind to hemoglobin. Figure 2.1 compares the effect of temperature on the affinity for oxygen of woolly mammoths and Asian elephant hemoglobin with and without red cell effectors. Okay? Uh, the question is, suggest why it's advantageous for Arctic mammals to have hemoglobin whose affinity for oxygen is only slightly affected by changes in temperature. So first of all, let's have a look at the graph. So um, here you can see uh, the, um, the extent to which temperature affects uh, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. And then here you've got the um, woolly mammoth is this bar and the Asian elephant is this bar. So you can see that hemoglobin on its own doesn't really... Um, have a big difference between the woolly mammoth and the Asian elephant. However, um, hemoglobin plus the red cell effectors in both, actually in both cases, you can see that there, the effect of temperature is uh, decreased um, uh, for, for the affinity of uh, hemoglobin for oxygen, but in both cases, but there's a greater decrease in woolly mammoths. So this would indeed suggest that the change in hemoglobin structure when, but only in the presence of red blood effectors, does indeed have an effect on the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. Um, so why would this be advantageous? Um, so the point is that um, the surface tissues would be colder than the core body um, in these extreme climates. So um, if the um, ability for hemoglobin to offload oxygen is changed by these colder by this colder climate, then um, you wouldn't be able to uh, maintain oxygen supply to these surface tissues. But if the temperature doesn't affect um, this ability, then um, the woolly mammoth could, in fact, uh, still maintain oxygen supply well enough to the surface tissues. 
Okay? Explain whether or not figure 2.1 provides evidence that woolly mammoths hemoglobin is better adapted to, for a cold climate than Asian elephant hemoglobin. So I've already sort of mentioned this, but um, there is not really a big uh, difference between these two bars, um, which suggests that um, there is a really small difference in effect of temperature on hemoglobin alone. Um, so there is no evidence for uh, the woolly mammoth hemoglobin to be better adapted. Um, however, there is a greater reduction in effect of, of temperature on hemoglobin with the red cell effectors, so the woolly mammoth hemoglobin is better adapted to cold in the presence of red cell effectors. Um, and yeah, so it, the mutation probably has an effect on the uh, oxygen binding sites. Okay. The components of a molecule of ATP are shown in figure 3.1 with references to the figure named Kubonos 1 or 2. So um, a nice simple question. Uh, so number one would be the adenine and number two would be the ribose. Okay. Describe the consequences for the cell of the following statements. Each cell has only a very small quantity of ATP in it at any one time. The molecules of ATP, ADP or AMP rarely pass through the cell surface membrane. Okay, so um, the cell uses ATP as um, its source of energy um, and because um, they rarely pass through the cell surface membrane, um, first of all, um, the ATP must be regenerated inside the cell. So what? So it's broken down to, use, to be used for energy and then the cell must regenerate ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Um, yeah, so both ADP and AMP must be synthesized in the cell. Okay. Glucose is a respiratory substrate. Table 3.1 shows the yield of ATP from some, uh, from some other substrates. So we've got alanine, glycogen, lactate and palmitic acid. Explain the difference, different yields of ATP from glycogen and palmitic acid. Okay, so palmitic acid much higher yield than alanine. Um, so this is because palmitic acid is a long fatty acid chain. So it's got much more CH bonds than alanine, which is a smaller um, amino acid uh, per, mol per mole. Um, so since the hydrogens are needed for ATP production or oxidative phosphorylation, um, the um, yield of ATP molecules is proportional to the amount of CH bonds that the molecule has. So therefore, palmitic acid will have a much higher yield than alanine. Describe the circumstances in which alanine and lactate are used as respiratory substrates. So um, alanine and amino acid, so um, proteins are broken down when there is a lack of fat or, or carbohydrate, and lactate um, is used in anaerobic conditions. Great. Next question. Blood samples were taken from a 29-year-old woman each day for a period of 43 days. The concentrations of estrogen, progesterone and luteinizing hormone in each sample were measured. The results are shown in figure 4.1. Um, so the red line is estrogen, the progesterone is shown by the black line and the blue line is luteinizing hormone. Estimate the length of the woman's menstrual cycle. Show how you worked out your answer. So I think um, the easiest way to work it out is to look at the pe two peaks and then measure the distance between them. So um, on this graph, we can show the distance between uh, the estrogen, the two estrogen peaks. So between here and here, um, and that works out to be um, so one peaks on day 13 and the second pe peak is around day 41. So the difference between the two would give you the length of the cycle. So that's um, around 28 days. So 28 days. <clears throat> okay. Um, the luteal phase is the part of the cycle when a corpus luteum is present in the ovaries. It begins immediately after ovulation and when menstruation starts. Okay. So using the figure it suggests when the luteal phase began and ended. Okay, so um, the luteal phase, when, when did it start? So um, ovulation happens when the surge of LH um, is at its peak. 
So that would I would say that's around um, day 13. So I would say began around day 13. And then ended um, is the dip of progesterone and estrogen since um, the corpus luteum um, is uh, degenerating. And then at the dip, um, because there's no more progesterone, um, menstruation um, is offset. So I would say um, somewhere around here. So maybe um, 29 or 30. So let's do 13 and 29. Okay. Name the organ that secretes a uh, luteinizing hormone. So this would be the anterior pituitary gland. Um, so just another sort of recall question. Describe the roles of LH in the menstrual cycle. So um, initially, uh, luteinizing hormone stimulates uh, the follicle, um, and then to, which uh, secretes um, estrogen. And when the concentration of estrogen um, re reaches around uh, four, ta four times its initial concentration, um, it triggers a surge in LH secretion, which in turn stimulates ovulation. Um, and then afterwards, uh, the this is, sorry the um, uh, development of corpus luteum is stimulated, um, which uh, secretes progesterone. However, progesterone has a negative feedback on luteinizing hormone. And therefore, the corpus luteum degenerates um, and menstruation is um, set. An investigation was carried out to determine whether the ability of a woman to perform a task involving spatial ability varied at different times of her menstrual cycle. The investigation involved 12 women. They each performed 24 similar spatial tasks on day 2 and day 22 of their menstrual cycle for six successive cycles. The tasks involved mentally rotating 3D shapes. Research has used two methods to determine the phase of the menstrual cycle. Each woman was asked when her previous menstrual period had begun. After the test, a blood sample was taken and the concentration of estrogen, progesterone and luteinizing hormone were measured. Suggest why the researchers used two methods to determine the phase of the menstrual cycle. Um, so um, this one could be due to the fact that um, each so the cycle of women, 28 days, um, is... Um, is an average length of the cycle. So there is quite a high um, irregularity of the cycles um, from cycle to cycle, but also from woman to woman. Um, so um, using two different methods is a little bit more reliable. So even just like if you were to take the blood sample um, without having any relative concentrations, it's not necessarily accurate enough to determine the exact day of the menstrual cycle. Um, and also, um, yeah, so that, that would be the reason to use two different methods. Um, and next, the mean score of women taking the test on day two was 10.5 out of 24. The mean score of women taking the test on day 22 was 7.38 out of 24. Discuss whether or not these results support the hypothesis that concentration of estrogen in the blood affects the ability to perform spatial tasks. So, um, yes and no. Um, yes, because um, the estrogen concentration was high in day 22 and low in day 2. Um, so yeah, this shows some correlation. So the lower the estrogen concentration, the better the women um, score on the test. However, this is only a correlation, so it's not necessarily um, linked. It's not necessarily a causal effect. Um, you can also say that there are other hormones that could be in place, so maybe progesterone, um, which has a similar profile to estrogen. Um, definitely not luteinizing hormone as on both days 2 and 22, those should be low. Um, however, the test only included 12 women, um, so it's quite a low uh, sample size. Um, so there would, so it would be ideal to control for other factors, first of all, and second of all, for more evidence. Um, and in, in addition to this, you could also perform some statistical analysis to determine if your results are significant. Question 5. Maize originated in the Americas and 55% of the world's maize production is from this part of the world. Figure 5.1 shows the mean yield of maize in the USA between 1860 and 2010. Um, okay. Describe the changes in grain yield between 1860 and 2010. So... 
we can see that there's no change between um, 1860 and 1930 at all. So it's uh, 2.2 tons per hectare um, of yield. Um, and then you can see that there is a slower increase between 1930 and 1960, which would be an increase uh, to 3.4 hectares. And then um, finally, from 1960 to 2010, there's a much greater increase. Um, so by 2010, the increase is to 10 hectares, uh, 10 tons per hectare, sorry, of grain yield. Okay. The greatest improvement in maize yields came after growers realized that maize hybrids have a much greater yield than in bread lines. Between 1860 and the 1930s, maize was allowed to pollinate naturally in the field. From 1930s onwards, maize seed was produced using double cross hybrids. To produce a double cross hybrid, two different maize plants A and B are crossed to produce a hybrid C. Two other maize plants X and Y are crossed to produce hybrid Z. The hybrid Z is then crossed with the hybrid. Sorry, it's like the hybrid C is then crossed with the hybrid Z to reduce the double cross hybrid. Okay. From 1960 onwards, maize seed was produced using single cross hybrids. This involves crossing one inbred, entirely homozygous plant with a different inbred plant. Explain why single cross hybrids are genetically uniform but double cross hybrids are not. So I think maybe the easiest way to show this is um, with the diagram. So um, single cross hybrids... Um, uh, are entirely homozygous. So let's say um, this is one and this is another plant. And then if you were to cross these, all of the offspring would be um, uniformly heterozygous. So um, they each inherit the same alleles. Um, however, double cross hybrids have heterozygous parents. So let's say... Um, like so. Or let's actually, um, if we were to think about, yeah, okay. And then your offspring could be maybe it's better to show um, a different gene, like so. So they're all heterozygous, but they're all uniformly heterozygous. Whereas in this case, you would get a variety of hetero and homozygosity. Like so. So in the double cross hybrid, um, they have heterozygous parents and each has inherited a different combination of alleles. So you would get a mixture of your homozygous dominant homozygous recessive and heterozygous hybrids. An experiment was carried out in 1996-97 to to investigate the relative effects of a genotype and environment on the yield of maize. Um, maize seeds with uh, different inbreeding coefficients were used. The greater the inbreeding coefficient, the greater the degree of homozygosity in the maize plants, Maize seeds with different inbreeding coefficients were planted in two different areas in 96 and the same two areas in 97. So here, is the, here are the results. Um, inbreeding depression is a reduction in vigor that results from inbreeding. Explain how the results in figure 5.2 demonstrate inbreeding uh, depression in maize. So um, we can see that the greater uh, the inbreeding coefficient, um, the lower the yield. So here... Um, if the inbreeding coefficient was 0 0.4, for example, in the 1997 site 2 line, um, then you can see that um, the inbreeding coefficients around, sorry, the, the grain the grain yield uh, tons per hectare was around 3.5, whereas um, if the inbreeding coefficient is higher, so um, around 0 0.9, 9 um, then the yield is much, much lower, more around 2 to 2.4, 2.5. Okay. Then next, explain how the results show that the environment affects maize yields. So this is trying to get at the idea that um, the yield differs um, in different sites in different years um, for the same inbreeding coefficient. So um, if you have a look, for example, um, if we have a look at the two um, site twos, for example, so this line versus this dashed line, you can see that the yield differs massively between those two. 
Um, and even if you look at in within the same year, so site one and two, um, if you compare those two, this one, for example, here is quite similar. But if we were to go to a lower inbreeding line, then you can see that the yield is quite different there and also at the other side of um, the graph. So um, this could be due to, um, for example, differences in temperature, um, the mineral content of the soil. With you know, if you were looking at the same site but in different years, um, then obviously between different sites you could have um, different mineral content. Um, and then it also obviously depends on the rainfall, temperature, and other environmental factors. Table 6.1 shows the mean axon diameter and mean speed of conduction of nerve impulses for four different animals. Um, with reference to Table 6.1, describe the effect of myelination on the speed of conduction of impulses in mammals. Um, so, uh, the effect of my, uh, myelination, so if we look at um, animal A and B, they're both mammals, um, the axon diameter is quite similar, and the only difference is that um, a is myelinated and B is unmyelinated and as you can see there is a drastic effect on the conduction speed so 3 versus 25 um, and then um, the next one the effect of axon diameter on the speed of conduction impulses in amphibians so amphibian examples C and D so they're both myelinated uh, but their axon diameter is different so one so D is 10 C is 14 and then um, there's a nice increase in um, the speed of conductions with the increase of axon diameter 30 to 35 in C. Explain how myelination affects the speed of conduction of impulses. So um, this one is sort of another um, descriptive question. Um, so the myelin is this fatty compound that insulates the axon. So um, which which means that where the myelin surrounds the axon, you cannot um, have any depolarization because the um, um, your ions cannot cross the membrane there. However, uh, there are no myelins at the nodes of Ranvier, um, and so therefore you can only get depolarization and action potentials at these nodes. Um, and then there are these local circuits that are set up between the nodes, and the action potentials sort of jump from node to node, um, so this is called salutary conduction, um, and this greatly increases the speed of um, the impulses um, because having, you know, instead of sort of the um, depolarization, having to go down the entire axon, this jump greatly increases the speed of conduction. So MS is an autoimmune condition of humans in which the body's immune system attacks the myelin sheath, which are then damaged. This leads to um, a decrease in information reaching the brain from sensory receptors. It suggests how the myelin sheath may, may be attacked. So this is an autoimmune um, illness, which um, means um, that the sheath, in this case, is recognized by the body as foreign or non-self. So um, a variety of immune cells. Um, antibodies, um, lymphocytes um, or phagocytes attack the sheath um, and the loss of the sheath. Um, uh, in the next question is explain why the damage leads to decrease in inflammation. So um, the breakdown of the sheath by the immune system means that the axon isn't insulated as well so the act action potentials could slow down or even stop um, due to um, the loss of salutary conduction and the leakage of ions. Um, an experiment was carried out um, into the effect of light on different of different colors on photosynthesis. 15 leaf, 15 leaf discs from the same plant were obtained. Five sealed test tubes were set up, each containing three leaf discs in hydrogen carbonate indicator solution. Hydrogen carbonate indicator solution changes color at different pH values. At the start of the experiment, the indicator solution in all five test tubes was orange-red. Four of the test tubes were illuminated by light of a specific color. The test tubes were illuminated for the same length of time, and then we've had a fifth test tube was covered in black, which was the control. So here are the results. Um, so white and blue light um, made the indicator change to purple. Green um, had no effect essentially, it remained orange-yellow, red changed to purple and um, no light remained yellow.
So when the pH increases, the indicator becomes purple, and when the pH decreases, the indicator turns yellow. Explain the results uh, for the leaf disc illuminated by blue light. So um, blue light is absorbed by the plant um, and used for photosynthesis. So uh, therefore, um, carbon dioxide is used. So the, so the carbon dioxide um, concentration decreases, and this leads to a rise in pH, um, because obviously carbon dioxide um, can be dissolved in water as carbonic acid. So um, if carbon dioxide is used up, um, less carbonic acid in the solution, which means that the solution will become more basic. Okay, explain why the indicator in the control went yellow. So in this case, um, because there's no photosynthesis, but there is um, respiration occurring. So this means that carbon dioxide is produced by the plant or released by the plant, um, which in turn leads to a decrease in pH um, by increasing the acidity of the solution. Cyclic and non-cyclic phosphorylation take place in the light-dependent stage of photosynthesis. Describe the role of accessory pigments in pho photophosphorylation. So this one is another sort of question that you either <laughs> know or you don't. So accessory pigments will absorb light um, and they pass the energy from that absorbed light um, into, onto, the primary, into the primary pigment, um, into the reaction center. Write a balanced equation that summarizes photolysis. So this one um, is another one of these questions that you know. Um, but it's, it's simple. So we have water is split to um, H plus plus electrons and O2. And balancing it, so we need two of the H plus um, and um, goes without saying two of the electrons and then only one O from O2, so half O2. State precisely the location of, photo of the photosynthetic pigments, so they are found in the thylakoid membranes within the chloroplast. The tiger uh, panthera tigris is classified as an endangered species by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. The IUCN publishes an annual list of endangered species called the Red List. Figure 8.1 shows the number of tigers in the wild between 1900 and 2010. So um, the question is calculate the overall rate of decrease in the number of tigers between 1900 and 2010. Give your answer to the nearest whole number. So various different ways of doing this. Obviously there isn't um, a constant rate of decrease throughout the entire process. Um, so one way of doing it is you could calculate the difference um, between the num number of tigers in 1900 and 2010 um, and then you can divide by the 110 so the number of years and if you do that it becomes down to um, 873. Describe the reasons why a named species has become endangered so you can pick um, an animal species or a plant species and then um, do more sort of like a general description of how a species could become endangered. So um, if we pick an animal species we can talk about sort of like a direct um, human effect, so hunting, um, collection, you know, um, using um, their animal products. So um, for example um, the ivory or the skin or the fur, um, then we can also talk about the fact that um, um, human settlements can uh, lead to uh, the destruction of habitats or fa habitat fragmentation um, and in addition to that an increase in pollution um, and of course climate change. Uh, then a plant species uh, we can once again talk about direct human effects, uh, deforestation, collection, um, habitat destruction, once again climate change, pollution things like that. Loss of pollinators, for example, so um, sort of like almost like an indirect effect. So if we have an effect on their pollinators, um, then we could um, indirectly affect um, um, their growth. Oh, and one more thing that you can mention is aliens. So an um, introduction of alien species by humans can also um, mean that there is an increased competition for um, food or increased predation. Okay, so this question, the passage uh, below summarizes the effects of georeliance on seed germination. 
complete the passage by using the most appropriate scientific terms. Um, so this one is, uh, if you <laughs> know about seed germination, hopefully this should be no problem. So when a seed is shed from the parent plant, it's in a state of dormancy, which means it's metabolically inactive. When water is absorbed by the seed, it stimulates the production uh, of gibberellin by the embryo within the seed. The gibberellin stimulates the synthesis of amylase by cells um, in the aluron uh, layer. <laughs> amylase hydrolyzes starch molecules um, in the endosperm, converting them to soluble maltose molecules. Um, however, these are still obviously disaccharides, so these molecules are converted to glucose, which is transported to the embryo, providing a source of carbohydrate that um, can be now respired to, to provide ATP as the embryo begins to grow. Gibralin causes these effects by regulating genes that are involved in the synthesis of amylase. It has been shown that the application of gibberellin to seeds can cause an increase in the transcription of the DNA coding for amylase, or expression of the DNA coding for amylase. Great. Explain what is meant by a gene mutation and outline the possible consequences of a gene mutation for an organism. Um, so uh, a mutation in a gene is um, an event, a random event that happens spontaneously. So it could be uh, a change in base um, by an external factor such as radiation or um, during DNA replication. Um, so the um, enzyme could make... Um, make an error and then the proofreading activity could um, fail to correct the mistake and um, often uh, this kind of substitution has no effect so it may code for the same amino acid or even if it changes the substitution of one amino acid um, there are some cases in which um, this could have a big effect on the protein however if it's um, in a non-essential area or if the substitution is um, a similar amino acid, sorry, an amino acid that has a similar structure uh, and properties, then it would have no effect. However, if a base addition or deletion happens, could have a greater effect on the phenotype because this could um, introduce a frame shift mutation um, as the bases are read in triplets. So this would um, alter the whole sequence of bases um, and, um, and it could change the entire sequence of the um, the protein. Additionally, um, a substitution or a deletion could also um, result in a premature uh, stop codon. Um, so this could also destroy the protein or just um, create uh, fragments of the protein. Um, and but the loss of function mutation isn't the only um, the only thing that could happen. So. Uh, by chance, although this is obviously a much smaller chance, uh, there could be sort of like a new function um, of the protein that's introduced. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So it can have, most of the time it's a loss of function mutation, hence recessive, and sometimes it can be, um, it can introduce a new function. Okay, and Explain how faulty CFTR proteins in cell surface membranes can lead to symptoms of cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis, this, uh, the CFTR proteins uh, are channel proteins, um, specifically chloride ion ch proteins, uh, channel proteins, um, and the mutation in the channel means that uh, the chloride ions cannot move out of the cell. Um, and this change also means that um, your sodium ions, in turn, cannot move out of the cell um, due to the charge. And this means that there's less water that can leave the cell. Um, and the current theory is that this uh, means that the mucus on the cell surface membranes of these cells that um, secrete the mucus stays thick and sticky. And this could lead to the symptoms, which are the following. So... Uh, the mucus, the thick mucus, isn't uh, moved um, effectively by the cilia, so this mucus can accumulate. And um, this means that the, ga the gas exchange um, is reduced, and it, this also uh, results in a symptom of difficulty in breathing. Um, in addition to that, the thick mucus can also trap bacteria, so there is an increased risk of, um, of infections in general. 
um, and all of this could lead to the lungs being scarred. Um, and a couple of additional um, symptoms that you can mention is uh, blocked perm and pancreatic duct. Okay, final question. Describe the main features of an organism belonging to the plant kingdom. Um, so there are lots um, of features that you can mention. So you can mention um, the cell wall, which is made of cellulose, um, the large central vacuole, um, the plasma desmata, um, the fact that um, they're multicellular um, and autotrophic. Um, some have chloroplast and chlorophyll and are photosynthetic. Um, they all have eukaryotic cells. Um, their primary storage compound is starch. Um, and because of, they're multicellular, so they have um, cells that are differenti differentiated into tissues. Um, then you can talk about some of the adaptations. Um, so um, you can talk about the cuticle, um, the vascularity, um, the guard cells and the stomata. Okay. Describe the structure of a mitochondria and outline its function in a plant cell. So um, mitochondria are organelles that are around between 0.5 to 1 micrometer in diameter. Um, they produce a double membrane um, and the inner membranes are folded up into cristae. And um, the cristae are the sites um, of ATP synthesis and the electron transport chain. And um, you can also mention an accumulation um, of hydrogen uh, of hydrogen ion gradient across the intermem in across the um, inner membrane and the matrix, so inside the intermembrane space. Um, and the matrix is the site of the uh, reaction uh, of the Krebs cycle. Um, and the mitochondria has its own uh, circular DNA, which um, and its own 70S ribosome, which is different from the endogenous ribosome. Um, and then um, you can mention that uh, the mitochondria uh, purpose in a plant cell, as it is in uh, an animal cell, is to produce ATP for the cell's needs. Okay, um, I think that's it. So thank you very much for uh, joining me. I hope you found that useful and I'll see you soon.